protection mechanism is a substantial one or not. What do we know so far about the main modes of transmission other than people looking at each other for more than 15 minutes and, and speaking and singing at each other? Right, so we know that person to person contact is essential and it drives this, uh, drives transmission. I think you can break it down into three parts. One is the transmission through respiratory droplets. These are larger droplets that travel roughly six feet. Um, uh, and, and really that type of transmission is fueled by close uh, contact, physical contact. Uh, the second is through what we call fomites or <coughs> person coughing or sneezing onto a surface. Uh, and then the third is the um, uh, aerosols. Uh, these are smaller droplets that travel much further. But, we, but what we know now, we don't actually have the exact figures, but the large majority of transmission is actually fueled by the kind of close contact through, air, for, through respiratory droplets within six feet. And that's good news in the sense that we know how to kind of, we know how to address that. It's use of face masks and to maintaining physical, physical distance, distancing in that scenario. Dr. Ko, Salvador, Brazil is a thousand miles or so north of Rio. You've had a huge commitment there to their medicine, their microbiology. I say this with great respect and nothing to demean the Brazilian government. Do you trust the statistics out of Brazil, out of South America, and out of Mexico? Yeah, so I think, you know, the, the, the key issue with surveillance and the numbers and getting re reliable numbers, and this is an issue here in the United States, is ramp, out, ramp up of testing being able to test people who are symptomatic with the disease and to test the vulnerable populations in those, uh, in those settings. This is truly a challenge here in the United States, even in our own vulnerable communities. Uh, but this is a challenge throughout poorer countries and developing countries and even richer countries among that group, such as, such as Brazil. Uh, certainly there are two key issues. One is, you know, which is key in, is the government uh, investment in the response. And we've seen the kind of the foibles and the problems uh, that uh, Brazil has had due to political concerns in the last, uh, you know, last 10, you know, eight to 10 months. Uh, the other is, is that, you know, there are places in Brazil which are doing extensive testing, places like Sao Paulo in, uh, in many of the states, Belo Horizonte, the city of Belo Horizonte, in the city that I work in, in Salvador, they're doing quite a bit of testing. So numbers are going to change based on where you are within a country. But the numbers actually, can, I think what's more important than the absolute number is the trends and where they're going to. Mm -hmm. Many of these places in, are either going up or they're staying the same. Doctor, I appreciate your time this morning. Thanks for being with us. Come back soon, won't you? Dr. Albert Coe there of Yale University. In the equity market, we do roll over just a little bit. We're down by about 19 points on the S&P 500. We are negative a half of 1%, Tom. Just a little bit of weakness creeping in. You know, this weakness coming in, and it, again, it's been, it's not that it's uncorrelated, John, it's just been disjoint all morning. That's, a, the, I guess, the way to put it. Let me take you to Augusta now. Con la que tu sonrisa me destruye la rutina Amo la elegancia con la que cuando baila grita que eres latina Amo esa sonrisa que tienes siempre aunque el mundo se te caiga encima Amo tu piquete de esquina y amo esa carita niña fina A mí me gusta como tú, no bailas como tú, ninguno como tú A mí me gusta como tú, no bailas como tú, ninguno como tú We can see the global warming accelerating at the moment and the goals that we must hit are so 
are so ambitious. It's 1.5 degrees by, by 2050, being climate, uh, climate neutral in terms of emissions by, by 2050. That's a huge challenge. We have to reduce emissions by 50%, 2030, 2040 again. Um, it's very, very ambitious. And mobility plays such a crucial role in there. One thing is to do it in developed countries. Uh, I think we're going to get there by 2030, but then the rest of the world, and that's just as important. If you look at developing countries, emerging countries, that's where probably the biggest challenge uh, we are going to face to also deploy EVs there and, and, and make mobility greener in those countries. I know it's possible to move mobility forward faster J'ai voulu combattre mes faiblesses sans empiler de camp J'ai voulu jouer mais au fond c'est à moi que je mens Avec l'histoire, avec le temps qui passe c'est évident Sans toi je suis perdu comme un enfant dans la cour des grands Et tu cherches à percer ma carapace, mon caractère Ne laisse pas la colère juger des bêtises éphémères Et pour toi j'avais des projets, je voyais les choses en grand Moi je veux des baleines dans l'aquarium, je vois les choses en grand Parce que t'es triste alors t'as décidé de m'effacer Le mal que je t'ai fait tu ne l'as jamais mérité T'as les larmes aux yeux quand tu les plonges dans les miens Moi j'ai le cœur qui saigne quand tu me sors du tien Moi j'ai le cœur qui saigne quand tu me sors du tien Moi j'ai le cœur qui saigne quand tu me sors du tien L'impression de compter les jours loin Bloqué sur une île Sans toi le futur est flou comme, comme un souvenir C'est ma façon de te dire bien Partager ma vie Pour toi je me prierai en mille Comme un autre Je te répète encore que le meilleur reste à venir Tu ressasses le passé, t'as sombré l'avenir Laisse-moi naviguer sur une rivière de diamants Je sais quand ça va pas, je t'entends même dans le silence Et ta souffrance résonne en moi sans cesse en abondance J'ai une longueur d'avance, refais-moi à nouveau confiance Et tu me menaces de partir mais tu vas aller où C'est pourtant simple, tu comprends pas qu'un plus un ça fait nous Est-ce que tu comprends Un plus un ça fait nous Est-ce que tu comprends Un plus un ça fait nous L'impression de compter les jours loin Bloqué sur une île Sans toi le futur est flou Comme, comme un souvenir C'est ma façon de te dire bien Partager ma vie Pour toi je me prierai en mille Comme un origami voices that maybe it's the morning after and John the vaccines really not out there and now we get into a churn of the immediate news it's a tug of war between the forward outlook looking better and the near-term outlook looking worse and a real divergence between the two and how policymakers navigate the former will allow markets to keep that hope about the latter that's the story for this market first half of the week all about cyclical appetite back half of the week Nasdaq kicks in again the, again this morning, Tom, with the S&P 500 down six-tenths of 1%, and NASDAQ futures just about positive on the day. That's the concern, near-term versus well, medium-term. Back to that kind of relationship, we're going to roll the data check through here, not just do one single data check because it's a mess this morning. I just saw a 93 print on dollar, and Lisa, that speaks to the resiliency of dollar. Yeah, we've had a weaker dollar, but we just seem to come back when the uncertainty reigns. Yeah, and that seems to be the theme that we've seen with all of the <coughs> bears on the dollar. They have been burned because when there is a risk off field, people go to the dollar. Look, I'm watching today, Tom. Uh, I'm watching Treasury yields, and it's in part because of the record auctions this week. But I think that what Chris Verone said in the last hour 
about how they want to bleed higher to that 130, 140 place. There is a question, and right now we're looking at a, at a 93 print on treasury yields, at basis points that is. There's a question, what does that do? How much does that rearrange equity valuations? How much does that rearrange people's longer term growth expectations? And John, I want to go to the real yield. I know you're in pre-production for the real yield tomorrow. <laughs> and I, you know, I make a joke of it, folks, but massive negative real yield, that nominal yield less the inflation or disinflation expectations, inflation data in this hour, and then you come down to the real yield. John, we've had a lesser negative real yield. Now what? Well, the real yield is at the epicenter <coughs> of a lot of these moves, Tom. It's been the underpinning of why we've had this positive correlation with gold and equities, because tech growth has been tethered to that story as well. And I think in many ways the U.S. dollar too. Remember, the U.S. dollar, the dollar index, DXY, bottomed back end of August, August 31st, big tech topped early September. That's been the relationship between foreign exchange, the U.S. dollar, weighted heavily towards the euro, and risk more broadly, growth, growth stocks. And I think that's interesting to see how that develops <coughs> in the coming months. It'll be interesting to see. And of course, the epicenter of the real yield, look for that tomorrow afternoon on a Friday with John working out of uh, London after mid-morning matters with John Farrell. You'll look for that later on this morning. <laughs> Right now, I got one more question, Lisa. I'm going to go to you. Am I right that in the last number of days, full faith and credit is really separated from high yield and investment grade? Is that a correct statement? That basically it's gotten more expensive for the U.S. government up until today to <coughs> borrow money, and it's gotten a lot less expensive for riskier companies to borrow money, which is typically what you'd see in a risk on environment. Basically, that spread, <coughs> that extra yield that investors demand right. is evaporating because they see the perceived risk okay. as dissipating. I mean, John, then let's go to the FT where they're talking about Mr. Loeb guessed the election right, he made a lot of money, and I think Mr. Ackman is suggesting Lisa's right, that's what we've seen, and he's betting against. Against it. John, do you see a bet that spreads will widen in credit? I see a lot of people who are uncomfortable with the idea of where spreads are right now, but not comfortable <coughs> enough to push the other way. Why? The central bank's in the game, fixing the price. We have a price insensitive buyer in credit. Tom, you've got to believe that somehow this market can give way to a central bank that's sitting there yeah. on the bid whenever anything goes wrong. And those important discussions John was mentioning uh, with the governors today. Right now, Beata Kerr joins us with Bernstein, A.B. Bernstein, co-head of investment strategies. Beata, we sort of laid out the present land here. How do you write for March of 2021 or investment out all through 2021? Well, uh, we think about a continuation of the same forces that the market has been reckoning with this calendar year, which is, of course, the challenge of COVID, uh, which is ongoing and escalating, as you've been discussing. But the offsetting force is the fiscal support and monetary support that's providing tremendous momentum and liquidity to the markets. And I think what you've seen over the course of the last week is really a recognition that so many people were waiting for event risk around the election and have re-engaged with the market as there is more clarity around that policy. So I think we have to wrestle well, with those two forces. Peter, I think a lot of people also thinking about whether we would have some regime change on the policy side, away from a monetary policy regime towards a fiscal policy regime. And I understand we've had a mix of both, but I do wonder for you, where you're sitting right now, what regime are we in at the moment on the policy front? We're in a regime that's been coordinated. And what we saw in the first quarter was an incredible response, both in terms of speed and magnitude. And that is ultimately what gave markets the comfort to start that steady march upward. And then over the summer, it's been frustrating to not see that second round of fiscal stimulus be passed. <clears throat> We really think the economy and ultimately the markets will be looking for direction around fiscal stimulus, a much smaller stimulus package than what would have occurred under the consensus views going into the election of a blue wave. But nonetheless, we do think you'll see in the numbers today that uh, there's still a tremendous number of people looking for work, out of work, that need help, and especially as COVID-19 ramps up uh, pretty relentlessly, we think that fiscal stimulus is going to be critical. Well, the numbers are ugly in the United States, and the prospect of D.C. doing more has diminished considerably over the last couple of months, as you've described. What are the capital allocation consequences of that for you right now as you look into year end? 
Yeah, well, I'm coming to you here from Chicago, Illinois, where we're the one state in the union right now that doesn't even allow indoor dining to give you a sense of the escalation and the potential for ongoing shutdowns and lockdowns. So we do see the vulnerability of the economy to ongoing stress from lockdowns. That being said, we are long-term bullish. And in fact, we went into September and the election slightly overweight equities. That has been the right call. And we have trimmed that back a little bit, but ultimately maintaining that position because we see vaccine optimism and earnings recoveries that are substantial in 2021. So, Vieta, let's build on that. Is there an idea then that the virus counts and all of the high frequency <laughs> data that people were pouring over earlier this year, that none of that matters right now if you've got a longer term view? Well, we don't think none of it matters. If you think about what happened in the spring, the market was really focused on a national health care crisis and the inability of the system to manage the virus. And what we've learned today, and you've had uh, prior guests this morning actually addressing this, is better treatment, ultimately lower fatality rates, and more targeted economic impact from more localized shutdowns. And I think that's what the market is effectively expecting. But again, we come back to the fact that we do think fiscal stimulus is necessary in some form. The sooner the better, but the odds of it happening this year yeah. are uh, being reduced as we speak. Man, you always fold a lot of math into this, and I love your phrase, the mathiness of the phrase, the idiosyncratic drivers. Discuss that. What's the new idiosyncratic driver? Well, in our opinion, as active investment managers for over 50 years at Bernstein, what it means is that being an index investor or simply investing in sectors today is not enough. There are a lot of underlying company fundamentals that you have to look at very specifically. We know that we're in a year where growth has led in an extraordinary way, but even within the growth style, um, there's growth at a reasonable price, and then there's simply momentum growth, and the valuation differences are huge. And you could say the same thing about value in terms of cyclicals and financials versus energy. So you have to look at the company, its balance sheet, its management team. Ultimately, we're focused on buying enduring businesses, and in the end, we think that focus on stock selection will prevail. Well, let's talk about that and let's finish there. Just give us an idea of how you do that. Earlier this week, when the positive news around the vaccine came out, the likes of AMC get bids up aggressively. I want to understand the difference between a company that just plays the catch-up trade on a bit of hopium on a Monday morning into Tuesday hopium. and something more durable through the recovery that you anticipate. Well, I leave that hard work to our research analysts and our portfolio managers who are responsible for ultimately kicking the tires with the management teams. But I can tell you that what our PMs have been doing over the last couple of weeks is picking up a little bit more in the cyclical space. But to give you an example, even within technology, for example, focused on semiconductors, an area that we think will continue to benefit from the stay-at-home economy, but ultimately support that reversal to going back to normal. Um, picking up a little bit more in the transportation sector as well as some of the most beaten down names in consumer discretionary and travel and leisure. So uh, that is how we're thinking about positioning today. Bideker, thank you. Always great to catch up. Thank you very much. Of A.B. Bernstein there on this market. On sport, our sports correspondent, Tom Keane, <laughs> mentioned to me as that conversation was ongoing that actually actually that play at the masters has been suspended due to inclement weather yeah, yeah. that took place at 7:35 eastern they got to be sensitive you know down at augusta john it's not like the british open where they just play 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 i mean i love the can i just say i love the british open because the rough is like this thick the putting green is like an inch you know hand it's motions like, it's for like radio no, but augusta's beautiful tom it Augusta's is just beautiful. That's my that's my well, favorite tournament. Tiger Tiger scheduled out at 8:05. Mickelson goes out at 11:37. Sam Snead after 12 noon. Tom, just quickly, it's really important that that weather fades and fades quickly. Sunset in Augusta, 5:27. Well said. Well this said. This tournament moved from spring to November. There are tee offs on the first and also the tenth because they need to get this really? done quickly before it gets dark so it's not all off from the first you have a series of players teeing off from the first hole and <clears> the tenth simultaneously to try and get these rounds completed some can you see me playing golf 
No. I I can see you <laughs> playing. Go. No. Four. Maybe in the car with a beer uh -huh. or something like that. Or something stronger, probably. Trevino, 68. You should play with him. Alongside Tom Keane and Lisa Brown himself, Jonathan Ferro. This is Bloomberg. With the first one news, I'm Rishka Gupta. The state of Georgia will conduct a hand recount of ballots for the presidential race. Joe Biden leads President Trump by a slim margin of about 14,000 votes out of roughly 5 million that were cast. The Trump campaign has alleged there was widespread voting irregularities, but it's offered no proof. Moderna is now poised to take the spotlight on a coronavirus vaccine. The company says its study has accumulated more than 53 infections that will allow a preliminary analysis of its effectiveness to begin. Moderna didn't predict how long it could take an independent monitoring committee to analyze the data. Oak Hill Advisors founder Glenn August says investors should be looking forward to the changes in Washington in January. August spoke with Bloomberg's Eric Schatzke. I believe that a Republican Senate and a Biden pre presidency supported by a Fed that continues to be accommodating, I believe that is a Goldilocks scenario for the markets. You can see more of that interview with Oak Hill Advisors Glenn August starting at 10 a.m. New York time here on Bloomberg TV. Global News, 24 hours a day on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Rishka Gupta. This is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Best, your weekly review of the most important business news analysis and interviews from Bloomberg Television around the world. Ken Burns, welcome to Bloomberg Big Decisions. We have always been a mixture of things. We are always stronger for that mixture. Growth is a way to stay competitive, delight more and more consumers. Welcome to the best of Bloomberg Technology, I'm Emily Chang. They've moved the needle by acknowledging that they have to monitor the content. What is one word of advice you'll take with you? Learn how to listen. And that is certainly something that has served me well. Ankiti, where do you go from here? It's a huge market. It's a huge opportunity. I want to go 100x from here. Our philosophy is to partner where we can and stand apart when we should.
a sense of the real-time action. The 10-year yield tumbling now 11 basis points to continuing in this knee-jerk risk-off field. Frankly, um, the, the Trump administration has basically given up and we're just kind of sitting there waiting for the vaccine and the virus is not waiting. The virus is, you know, it's all around us. Well, Lawrence Gost in there, Georgetown University professor on the hopes for a vaccine, the reality of a difficult position this country is in through the next couple of months into year end to the start of 21. Here's the price action this morning. Good morning to you all. Alongside Tom Keen and Lisa Abramitz, I'm Jonathan Farrow, live on Bloomberg Radio and TV.